Welcome to our second common session of Sunoikis Digital Classics 2017. Today we have a session about encoding of ancient texts with Gabriel Bodar and Simona Stoyanova from London. They will uh, talk about uh, um, standards, uh, tools and methods for encoding text with uh, a specific reference to XML markup and the TI uh, EPIDOC uh, subset. So welcome Gabriel and Simona, both Gabriel and Simona are well members of this community since the beginning. They have participated in many common sessions and they have contributed with many common sessions. Welcome again. And now you can start, you can share your screen. I think Simona is going to start. Yes. Okay. Hi. Good. <laughs> Hi. I'll start. Uh, let me screen share and see if you can uh, See the slides. Is this all right? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. So this is the session on encoding of ancient texts, and as Monica said, today it's me and Gabby. Uh, so first, a short overview of the class. We'll do a tiny introduction to markup and what markup means. Then Gabby's going to uh, walk you through Leiden TEI and various XML tools, some of which we will be using today in the class. Then we'll give you a technical introduction to how XML works and how its syntax looks like. And then we have prepared two demonstrations, uh, one on Oxygen, one on the Papyrological Editor, which are two of the tools that Gabby's going to introduce. Um, so, let's start. Introduction to markup. So, this is chapter 9 of the Thucydides' uh, history of the Peloponnesian War, the 1910 English translation. As you can see, it's just a bunch of text um, describing something. It's a story. So, what can we do with it, with markup? Several things. First, we could, for example, analyze its structure and do the following, break it down into paragraphs. In this case, we have three paragraphs. Each one begins with the P tag and is closed with the closing P tag. That's what we call structural markup. Another kind of markup is semantic markup, where, for example, like this, we analyze the contents of the text of the material that we have and then for example in this case we have decided to tag the personal names in this section of the Peloponnesian War with the first name tag. So that's kind of the two basic types of markup, the structural one and the semantic one. So um, HTML and XML are to the two main sort of markup languages we'll be talking about. Um, HTML being the renditional one. As you can see in the first example over here, we have three cases in which something um, has been tagged with an I tag, which means italics. So render this bit of text in italics. However, with semantic markup, we capture the meaning of what's actually being said. So we don't say render this in italics, but we say this phrase is foreign as opposed to the rest of the text in which it appears, or this phrase is a title of a book, or this word is used to emphasize something. And that's the basic difference between renditional and semantic markup. Um, so XML, <coughs> excuse me, is a data format. Um, as you can see, the tags of the Text Encoding Initiative are in kind of English, so we could say it's sort of human readable, but it's not necessarily so, and that's not the point of it. Um, and we can transform the XML that we have via XSLT to various formats depending on what we want to do with our files in the end. So we could transform our files for publication or for interchange between different projects, uh, cross-walking between different data formats for search and discovery, for all sorts of things. Also, depending on the uh, <clears throat> end result that we want to achieve, 
we can have different kinds of transformation. For example, an educational publication might not include all of the scholarly information that an academic publication might include. So depending on what we want to achieve, some of the distinctions, of the semantic distinctions, might be enhanced or leveraged, depends. So, um, as we said, XML is a data format um, and as such it can be transformed into different things for different purposes. And common output specifically for the humanities, which includes TEI and its Epidoc subset, um, is different publication types. For example, print or mobile and website versions. Um, there are different um, editions, depending again on what we want to do with our material. So we could have interpretative or diplomatic or student educational editions with, let's say, translations as opposed to only apparatus criticas, etc. And on top of that, we can uh, choose how to index our material and design our search index and concordance. How does that happen? That happens, as we said, with XSLT. So, for example, if we have one XML file, which then we want to transform into HTML, then we have one XSLT that does the transformation. However, if we have a collection of texts, all encoded in XML, then we only need one single transformation to generate various indices and tables of contents and concordances from them. So it's really, it's really quite useful um, for the creation of various types of publications to have one transformation that achieves a lot of things from uh, many input files. And now we go to Gabby's first bit. Shall I stop screen sharing so he can continue? Yep, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simona. Um, let me try and find my screen share now. Sorry, I've got so many screens open. It's going to take me a second. Um, where are my slides? Okay. Um, sorry, I should have prepared and skipped forward. So yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, tonight. I, I'm going to talk for um, a couple of minutes about um, a particular um, use of markup, as uh, Simone has just been talking about, um, for encoding uh, ancient text. And we're using the example of um, Epidoc, which is a variant um, of the TI produced by the Text Encoding Initiative um, called TI. To, um, to encode ancient documentary texts in particular, but um, it, can, it can be used you know, for various other, um, other, other uh, text variants um, as well. Um, so, but before that, I want to talk um, a little bit about um, another markup language which has existed since before um, the computer, and I wonder, um, should I be making this full screen to, uh, um, to I think you know, have to see the header, the, all my toolbars and everything, but um, no, never mind. Um, no, it's visible, it's big enough, I think. Yeah, I think that's fine, yeah. So um, I want to talk just for a couple of minutes about a markup language which is called, uh, commonly called Leiden, um, it's the, the Leiden Conventions. Um, and this is a markup language which was codified in 1931. Um, it wasn't entirely new, as in people had been using markup in this way for many years before, but it codified it and it, it really tied it down to a very sp particular set of uh, symbols and a particular set of meanings um, and a particular set of conventions for the use by originally papyrologists um, and also epigraphists. And um, the way this um, this markup scheme works, and this is this is a markup scheme in exactly the same way that XML or HTML or the other markup schemes that um, Simona has mentioned um, are markup schemes, because it is um, it is very arbitrary what symbol represents what semantic 
um, convention um, has, uh, has has nothing to do with what that um, what that symbol actually means in any other context, and what um, and it should be uh, unambiguous. So a square bracket always means that there are letters missing in the original text, um, and then the the surrounding symbols tell you whether or not the edit has restored those letters or um, or not. As I say, um, so Leiden. Um, effectively, and there's, on, on your screen here, you've got a very um, uh, a, sim a simplified version of a few of the most common um, symbols in the Leiden conventions. Um, and as you can see, um, the uh, the first few of those show a slight difference in how you uh, how you indicate um, characters depending on whether or not the editor uh, thinks they know what was supposed to be read there. Um, Leiden conventions were, were designed, and these, these signals were designed specifically for indicating uh, information about damaged texts, about uncertain texts, um, about texts with various issues, problems, things that need interpretation, things that need restoration, things that need uh, emendation. So there, um, for example, the first, um, the first item on here shows if you have a row of dots um, appearing in your um, in your edition of a text, and there are no brackets or parentheses around that um, row of dots. Then this tends to re represent a uh, a series of illegible characters, um, which the editor hasn't attempted to resolve or restore. So the characters are either illegible because they're they're heavily damaged. This could be on a piece of papyrus where the ink is more or less washed off. You can see traces of ink, so you know there was writing there, but you can no longer read it. It could be a piece of stone that has been sheared off midway through a line, and all you've got are the very bottoms of the uprights of the characters in that line, where you know it's impossible to tell whether it was just a row of eyes or um, or uh, other characters that have vertical hastai. Um, or it could be um, text that was written with such a scrawling, um, scruffy handwriting that we've just got no chance of interpreting it anymore. Um, that's how you would probably uh, attempt to transcribe something that I'd written, for example. Um, the, uh, the second row here shows you what happens if you have something similar where the letters are either very poorly executed or are damaged in some way. And so looking at each individual letter would be ambiguous. But taken in the context of the rest of the line, you think you have a pretty good guess as to what those letters are. So you do transcribe the letters. The editor does transcribe the letters. But the editor transcribes them with the dots, which in the, the previous um, instance would have been on their own. These dots are beneath those letters to show that those letters are um, extremely insecure outside of their context. They can usually be pretty clear in their context. Um, for example, if you've got um, a character which could either be an alpha or a lambda followed by two lambdas, it's almost certainly got to be an alpha because no Greek word has three lambdas in a row in it, right? So you can be very, very certain about it, but nevertheless you indicate it as um, ambiguous by putting a dot under it because, um, because of that, the, the physical um, uh, ambiguity of it. And the same, the same distinction applies when you um, you have letters that are entirely lost, so not a single trace of either ink or, um, or of, of engraving in the stone or, or whatever other um, form of writing you have um, remains um, on your surface. Um, then you put you, either your characters or your dots to represent that you don't know what was there um, in square brackets. This means the letters were completely lost. Um, and if you have letters inside, it means I've restored these purely from context, purely from comparison with other texts. Um, but um, but not not by looking at what you know what, what what the surface looks like where they where they were. If you can see anything on there, you don't use you don't use square brackets. So the ambiguity uh, there is no ambiguity between a row of dots in square brackets and a row of dots with no square brackets um, because the, the difference is clear uh, between them. No editor will ever say should there be square brackets here or not. I'm not sure what, what which to use. Um, no editor will ever, no, no um, epigraphist or papyrologist will ever read a text and say what does he mean, what, does, what, does the, what did the author mean by putting square brackets there? Um, does it mean that there are any traces of characters or not? It's unambiguous what, what those mean, so long as you know that the, um, the editor is using the Leiden conventions. There are other conventions in use which 
um, which may have slightly different meanings. So that there's, that there could be ambiguity there. Um, and the the third example is um, is almost exactly the same. You have um, these angular brackets, which represent um, letters that were never written on the surface, but the editor believes they should have been, and that the um, the scribe or the stone cutter had erroneously left out some some characters on the on the surface. And the editor either knows what they are and puts puts the characters in there with um, anchor brackets around them, or doesn't know what they are. Just clearly, this text was unfinished and something was missing here. Um, in which case, they leave the dots um, inside the anchor bracket. A couple of slightly different um, features at the end here are um, where a text is written in abbreviation um, and the editor is able to expand that abbreviation. Then the, the text, whatever text was written on the papyrus, is written um, just as, as transcribed, um, the letter A in this, um, in this example on the screen, and what, um, what was not written on the papyrus or on the stone, but is um, able to be uh, expanded or resolved by the editor is put in parentheses in there. So um, the most common example of that is um, something like um, you know, the abbreviation AUG for Augustus, where AUG is written on the stone and Ustus is not written on the stone, but it's able to be expanded by, by the editor because we know um, what went in there. Um, and the last two examples um, are letters that are considered superfluous, that is to say, letters that were written um, but that the stone cutter wrote in error, um, um, and those are, those are put in these curly braces. So if the letters really didn't belong in this text, the most common thing is is, um, is ditography, but there are other cases where, where um, the editor might, for example, have written a number and then written the number out in words as well, or um, you know, written a word, written a word um, that, um, that really didn't belong in the sentence, or maybe that belonged somewhere else, um, you know, recopied from the previous line or something, those sorts of mistakes um, can be made. And then the last of these um, on here is a slightly different feature, because this is not describing the state of the, um, the, in, uh, the, the editor's interpretation of the state of the text. It's making a more or less um, objective observation that, um, the, uh, that somebody, not necessarily the original stonecutter, most likely not the original stonecutter, has deliberately attempted to erase the, um, the letters involved. Um, and this could be um, something like Daminatio Memoriae, where someone has taken a chisel and removed the name of, of, of an emperor or another official who, um, who is deemed to no longer exist um, from, from an inscription. Or it could be simply crossing out um, on, a, um, on a papyrus or um, the practice of subpuncting under, under the characters of a, um, uh, of a word in a, in a manuscript to say, you know, this word was put in by accident and we want to, we want to remove it. Um, so it's it's deletion um, in the uh, in the semantic sense rather than um, rather than uh, you know necessarily physically removing the the surface. It's marking that this shouldn't be read um, in one way or another. Um, so so that's just a quick overview, as I say, of, of some of the the, um, the the most obvious um, characters and symbols used in the um, the Leiden conventions. Um, I've put on this um, on this slide a couple of links. Um, to other places where you might go and find out more about this if you um, if you uh, if you're not familiar with them and you want to know more but that's just a, a basic um, sort of background the point being that this is a markup language um, of, of exactly the kind that we've talked about where a uh, a symbol a character um, in um, in a digital text this is um, this is you know a a, uh, a character point on um, on your text, just as the just as the letters in between them are, and just as the spaces in between words are, um, but these um, these characters, these brackets in most cases or dots, um, they don't uh, have an alphabetic meaning. Rather, they have a semantic meaning that helps you to interpret the characters around them. Um, now, this is this is this is fine. So, as we've we've said, you know, you this is perfectly. Um, readable to someone who's trained in the Leiden conventions, and there's no ambiguity. The, the, the reader knows exactly what the editor meant. The editor knows what to write um, when they know what, um, what state their text is in. The downside of the Leiden conventions, which, to be fair, no one could have predicted in 1931, is that they're not um, as computer readable as a, um, as a technical markup language would be, as something like XML or HTML would be. So it's harder to train a computer 
to treat angle brackets, um, to treat the square brackets or the dots or other things as separate from the surrounding text and to do um, conversions of various kinds with those texts, with those characters um, within, within, the, within the brackets. So, um, I mean, it's not, it's not actually technically any harder to, to ask a computer to, to deal characters in, in curly braces differently than it, than it is to ask um, a computer to deal with characters surrounded by XML tags, but, um, but it's, the XML is a convention which is used in many, many different disciplines, um, not only in, in papyrology and epigraphy, um, and so there are tools which can do this for us already. Um, so the, the point is, we get much more bang for our buck um, with computer processing of our texts if we were to use XML to encode the semantic distinctions in our texts rather than using the Leiden conventions. So this is where Epidoc comes in. Um, the XML language uh, TEI, as I mentioned a moment ago, is used very, very widely by thousands of different um, humanities and social science projects to encode texts um, in exactly the kind of way that, um, that, uh, that we've talked about and that Simona talked a little bit about before. Um, and so if we encode our text using those same conventions, um, there are a lot of tools out there which can do processing on those, um, on those texts for us already. Um, so Epidoc uh, came along in um, 1999 and proposed a way to map um, from the Leiden conventions, which every epigraphist and papyrologist um, of, of classical texts um, understands, to the TEI. Um, and this is, um, this, is, this is not exactly how it was proposed in, um, in uh, 1999, but this is, this is how Epidoc now proposes to map from, um, from the, uh, the, the Leiden Convention on the left to the uh, TEI tag on the right. And so you can see a combination of the tags in blue and attributes in, in, um, in orange or brown there. Um, and the original um, Latin text in, um, in black type in the middle, um, it's a lot more verbose than the, um, than the, the Leiden on the, on the left, but um, as, um, as Simona said, verbosity is not, um, is not a problem with, um, with XML. It doesn't have to be human readable. It doesn't have to be um, pretty to look at. The point is it's much easier for a computer to interpret and process in various ways. Um, there's much more detail about how um, Epidoc works um, in the two links again at the bottom of this page and, and how you would encode a particular um, Leiden um, feature in, uh, in Epidoc um, at the Epidoc guidelines and also at the Leiden Plus guidelines produced by the um, papyrological editor um, folks. Um, but, um, and I won't go through all of these in as much detail as I did um, when I was talking about the Leiden a minute ago, but just to show a couple of examples, perhaps the easiest example to look at is the example of um, the, the, last, the, the last but one um, example there, the text in curly braces, which means that this text is superfluous, that the editor believes the scribe wrote these characters um, in error and didn't, didn't actually mean to include them in the text and they shouldn't be included in the text. Um, and in that, we simply use a um, TI tag uh, surplus, which, um, which basically has exactly the same meaning as those curly braces in Leiden. Um, this is in fact a case where rather than um, Epidoc having to decide based on our understanding of Leiden, which um, of the many existing TEI tags we should use to represent this particular semantic distinction, this is a case of where TEI didn't really have a semantic distinction for text that had been written but shouldn't have been there. Um, and on Epidoc's request, um, on our request, the, the TEI invented the tag surplus specifically for this, for this purpose. So this is, um, this is very similar to what, um, I mean, many of these, it's, it's, it's very similar. You have the opening surplus tag and the closing surplus tag, and they represent the opening curly brace and the closing curly brace. Similarly, del opening and closing represent the opening and closing um, double brackets there um, in the in the line. And similarly with unclear, the well, not quite the same with unclear. The opening and closing unclear brackets um, capture the entire span of um, damaged and ambiguous text, whereas in line each character is represented with an underdot beneath it rather than a symbol at the beginning or the end. And so that's slightly uh, slightly different. And supplied is more or less exactly the same, only that. Um, TEI didn't distinguish between characters, between text that was supplied because it had been entirely lost and text that was supplied because it had been erroneously omitted. And 
So the, um, the epidoc had to use uh, this attribute to further subdivide the, um, the meaning of the gap element. Gap doesn't just mean text that, um, that, that we have left out of our edition um, for one reason or another. It, it means any, any, any place where there is a gap in our edition. So we have to specify that it's a gap because the text is lost, as in the case of um, square brackets, admitted in the case of angle brackets, or illegible, as in the case of the dots without any brackets around them at all. Um, and the, the point to note here is that we have no black type text in this line of XML at all. This, um, this is because the entire text of the Leiden symbol on the left here is all markup, right? There's a, a, in, in the example like the, um, the uh, restored text, um, ABC in square brackets, the square brackets are the markup and the ABC is the transcription. But where we have the square brackets and the dots, neither of those is the transcription because the square brackets mean it's lost and the dots mean we can't restore it. Both of those are markup. So they're both replaced by um, XML um, on, the, um, on the right hand side. Um, so I won't go into this in any more detail. I just wanted to um, sort of highlight this as, um, as, a, as a, an overview. Um, do have a look at the, um, at the guidelines um, down below. Um, the, um, for, the, for the exercise, which we'll talk about later, we'll, we'll be asking you to go and work on some of these texts yourselves. So um, you will need to look at the guidelines um, for that. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that um, shortly. Um, so the, the next thing I wanted to do was to really just to sort of get it out of the way is to talk a little bit about a couple of XML tools that we can use um, for, um, for editing um, markup in this in this way. And I'm going to talk um, about five um, tools um, that you can use to mark up XML. And I'm going to talk very, very quickly about these because we're then going to look in a little bit more detail um, at a couple of them. We're going to look at Oxford and we're going to look at the Papyrological Editor. Um, but I'll briefly mention the others and, say, and explain why it is that for, um, for the exercise that we're talking about, we've decided to recommend the XML Editor, the, the Oxygen XML Editor. So um, the first thing to, 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 to note about the um, Oxygen XML editor, which is um, downloadable from the link um, you, uh, that we've given you here, is that this is really um, one of the richest and most fully featured XML and programming editing tools um, available in there. It doesn't only give you um, all sorts of um, built-in features for editing XML, but also for editing um, XSLT, the transformation language for XML that um, Simona mentioned earlier, but also for programming languages such as Python or PHP um, or whatever. It has built-in syntax highlighting and all sorts of things um, in there. It will also do transformations for you. It will do all sorts of um, different views. And so it's one of the richest um, um, XML tools um, that you could possibly want. Um, it's not, it's not a free tool, um, and I tend generally to, to try to recommend free tools for, for everything um, we use, not only because you know free is nice, because no one has lots and lots of money, but, um, but because um, open source tools are more, um, you know, are, are preferable for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, the academic license for Oxygen, however, is only $99, so that's not expensive if you're running a project. Um, if you know, if you're a student who's just going to use this to practice with for one week, that's obviously you know an, an unfeasible um, price. But um, Oxygen does also offer a 30-day uh, demo version, um, which is free, um, which means you can use all of the features fully featured for 30 days without without paying for anything. And then after 30 days, if you want, um, if you decide you want to keep this, you have to um, acquire a license um, somehow. Um, and so the sorts of features that Oxygen offers um, include color coding um, of, um, of elements and attributes, um, similar, um, very similar to the color coding that I used in this, um, in this example a few slides back. Um, it will offer autocomplete features. It will offer contextual menus for um, elements and attributes um, and things that appear at a particular point in the document. Um, and as I said, it will do uh, transformation for you. If you have some XSLT as well as some XML, it will allow you to, to write scenarios, to do various types of transformation. It will do various things in there for you. So it has features that, that no, nothing um, that is nearly as cheap as this um, could possibly offer. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the reason that we've, we've gone um, 
we've got for this. Um, if we if we wanted to be um, to be much more uh, strictly open source with our um, XML editing, um, as as I would you know with any other tool in the world, I would I would normally recommend. And with um, and I know the um, the Sonokesis, um Digital Classics a program as a whole does try to be as open source as possible, um, just to, to to you know um, so so as not to. Uh, exclude anybody from um, from being able to follow this. Um, the the one alternative which which has been used with some success is um, a tool called EasyMax. Um, this is um, a downloadable from the link um, uh, given above. Um, this is um, a tool put together by Peter Heslin in in Durham. Um, it's a, a bundle of various tools related to the Emacs um, programming editor, which is an open source tool, which is very, um, very popular among um, programmers of, of, a, of a certain stripe. And um, this is free and it is open source, which means that you can not only can you take it away and use it without having to pay um, any money for it, but you can also change it. You can um, improve it. Um, other people can improve it. You can share the improved version. It's, it's um, it's 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 very um, transparent um, and everything, which is which is all great. Um, it is um, it can it will offer you validation of your XML and it is it will give you um, uh, complete uh, you know uh, uh, element completion um, uh, based on the schema that you give to it. Um, it doesn't, however, have any XSLT support, so you can't transform your XML um, using. Um, using this tool. Um, we're not going to be doing any XSLT or transformation for this week's um, topic, um, so that, that doesn't matter so much for us. It is, however, harder to install and it's slightly harder to learn to use than Oxygen, which, which may, pretty much works out of the box. So, um, so feel free to try and use EasyMax if you, if you want to. Um, it'll be a little, bit more, um, a little bit more of a learning curve than, um, than using Oxygen. But as I say, if you want to carry on using this for more than 30 days and you don't have $99, um, or uh, a generous departmental budget to um, to pay for that, then a free version may be um, may be uh, what you need. Um, there are of course many other both um, both non-free and free um, XML editors out there, and I couldn't possibly talk about all of them. Um, but but these of of the of the non-free ones and the free ones respectively, these two are probably the two most likely. Um, options that um, that you might want to use. Um, I want to talk, in a way, about about another option, which um, which I, I don't seriously recommend as an option, but just to make make the point that because XML is um, in essence it is just plain text. The, the 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 coloring and the syntax highlighting that you see in the examples we've given you that you see in Oxygen are purely to make life easier for us, to, so we can read it more easily. But what is really going on there is just plain text. So you can create and edit and save XML just in your favorite text editor, Notepad, text edit, whatever, even Microsoft Word, whatever um, you use as a text editor, you save your file as text only um, and then just give it a .xml suffix at the end. And so long as what you have created is valid XML, um, it can be treated as any other XML file can be treated. So you can do all of that and that's, as I say, that's free. Um, or in, even if it's not free in the sense of open source, the, the text editor tool, um, there, there will be a text editor tool of some kind installed on your computer, whatever, whatever you have. Obviously, this text editor won't give you any validation support. It won't give you any schema support. It won't give you any um, highlighting. It won't give you any auto-completion. And it certainly won't give you any XSLT transformation support. So it'll give you, you know, it, I, I don't think that, you know, I've been using XML for 15 years. Um, if I were to try and create an entire XML file in text edit, um, I'm pretty sure that I would make mistakes. And because I don't have a validator in that tool, I wouldn't, I wouldn't notice those mistakes until I later tried to transform it using another tool. So it would, um, it would be a problem. It's, it's going to be hard to use it in this way. So I'm not actually recommending this. But the point is, if you, you, know, you don't have to pay for an expensive XML editor. You can, um, you can use anything in which you can edit text to edit um, XML. Um, the last two tools I want to talk about are both variants of a tool called um, SoSol, the Son of Suda Online tool, which is an XML editor um, originally created by the, um, 
the Papyrus Info project. Um, and so the first version I'm going to talk about is the Papyrological Editor. This is an online tool, so it's free to use. Um, you have to be online while you're using it, and also the server on which it's hosted has to be um, working at the time you're attempting to use it, which, I mean, it is working 99.9% .9 of the time, but just occasionally it, um, it, it goes down for um, for maintenance or whatever, so you have to be um, aware that you know, you're, you're, you're using this on the sufferance of the people who, who own it. It does offer validation. It does offer in-browser preview, which is a form of XSLT transformation for you, although only using the, um, the style sheets that are um, created by that project. Um, you can't you load your own style sheets into it. Um, and it is very project, project specific. It has limited functionality. It will only allow you to use the Epidoc schema, not other schemas, and only the version of the Epidoc schema that the pathological editor uses. Um, and um, so this, it's very limited in what, um, in what you can do with it. Um, you can't tag place names or personal names in it, for example. Um, but you can um, use it to um, to create your XML, um, and the, the one thing which um, which I didn't mention is that it um, it does have a tags-free editing um, version, so which allows you to use a language called Leiden Plus, which is very similar to the Leiden conventions we um, showed you a minute ago, almost identical to the Leiden conventions, and um, and it will internally interpret that Leiden as the equivalent. Um, Epidoc XML alongside it. Um, so you can use that to much more quickly produce your XML than you would um, do in, in, in an XML editor by hand, um, and then download the XML, and then you can do things that you can't do in the Papyrological Editor with, um, with that XML elsewhere, such as tagging place names. Um, so that's, that's one thing that can be useful for. Uh, the Gabby, so, of this. Yeah. Gabby so, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Just one thing. Sure. Maybe uh, we can explain what uh, SoulSoul means. Uh, so why Son of Suda Online? Right. Yes. So, um, so there's um, there's a, a, a tool that was created in 1998 um, for a project called the Suda Online, which was a collaborative editing tool um, for translating. The, in, in originally for translating the Suda um, text um, collaboratively. So there are 30,000 um, entries in there. No one person was going to translate them all, so hundreds of people collaborated to, to translate them. Um, and in, in fact, it took about 15 years, but then the whole thing was, um, was translated. Um, the, the son of Suda Online, Sozal, is not um, a technical variant of, or a technical development of, the original Suda Online tool, but it's an intellectual um, descendant of. It's inspired very much by the workflow mechanisms that were written in the original Suda Online. So the name is um, is, a, is an homage, if you like, to to the original Suda Online tool. Okay, thank you. Because sure. that yeah, <laughs> a small community knows that, so this is important. Yes, that's explain. true. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, thank you. That was that was useful useful to um to remind to remind people of yeah. Um. So the, um, the Perseids project, which is one of the projects um, of the Perseus Digital Library in Tufts, um, has also created a tool which is a variant of the SOSOL tool originally created by the um, Papyrological um, Editor, um, um, which of course is an open source tool and so the, the code is available and people, you know, people are able to take it away and do new things with it. And the Perseids did exactly this. They, they took a copy of SOSOL um, and they, you can see this slightly different tool at the URL given here. Um, this also um, is an online tool that you can use for free, it is open source, it offers you validation and in-browser preview. Um, it gives you slightly more by way of color coding and auto-completion than the, um, the Apological Editor version did, but it doesn't give you the tags-free editing um, environment. Um, it's, it's, it has slightly different um, purposes and functionality. It is very specific to a particular project or a particular series of projects in um, the, the Perseids um, run, and you can um, you can download uh, the the XML um, from it for use in an editor as um, as with the other version. So I've taken a little bit longer to talk about that than I, than I intended to. So I'm going to as quickly as possible pass back to Simona to give a, a technical introduction to to what XML is. Yeah, just let me screen share once you stop yep. doing that. Okay, do you see that? Yep. Okay, 
So a quick introduction to what XML actually is and how it works. It's made out of plain text um, and both the content that you put in it and the tags like the name, etc. That's all plain text. Um, oh, sorry, one important thing. So characters which are used in the XML syntax like the angle brackets and the ampersand should be escaped and the angle brackets are escaped with these entities and the ampersand with this entity because when you open your XML editor once we start doing the exercises and you type an angle bracket you will see that the editor interprets that as the beginning of an element rather than as plain text so that's something to remember okay so an element is made up from a tag and its content and an opening tags, uh, tag looks like this it's enclosed by angle brackets then we have some content the closing tag looks the same way except it has a forward slash at the beginning there is something called an empty tag which is a tag which does not have any content and the shortcut for that rather than repeating on opening and closing and then having nothing in between the shortcut for that looks like this so it looks like the closing tag but the forward slash is at the end of the element rather than at the beginning like here and an example of an element is this one so that's this is the structure of xml we have an element then we have a space then we have an attribute which is used to say something more about the element to define it further in some way then and the attribute has a value in double quotation marks then we close the opening tag this whole thing is the opening tag we have the content we are marking up and then we have the closing tag and an example of this is the following so we have an element quad for coordinates and we want to say what type of coordinates so we use the attribute type with the value latitude we close the opening tag we put the content in the middle and then we close <coughs> excuse me the closing tag that's what an element looks like which means that white space is significant um, it's significant where you put the white space it's not significant how much white space there is so for example uh, p type oops, sorry p type written like like this is wrong xml because the attribute and the element are mangled without a space in between and that would be interpreted as a mistake by the xml editor p type with the space in between means that, that we have the element paragraph and we have an attribute with the value new so this is correct the same uh, with two words where do we put the space between two words well wherever we want the space to be displayed so uh, normally that would happen between the elements surrounding each of those words rather than inside the element like this that will be wrong but as i said it doesn't matter how much white space you put somewhere so this example and the next example that means exactly the same thing or even this okay so these are the five rules that you absolutely need to remember when you work with xml everything else that we've said is sort of general information introduction but these are the five things that you cannot do without when working with xml so any angle brackets and the ampersand character must be escaped because as we said they are used uh, in the actual xml syntax so they are interpreted as starting an, an element uh, all open tags must be closed so everything that's open we need to close it when it contents finishes 
all elements must be contained by all ancestors, which means that we can't overlap elements. Everything must be nested. So we open a paragraph inside a page, but the paragraph must be closed before we close the uh, tag for the page and so on and so forth. Which then means that the entire XML document needs to be contained by one root element to rule them all. And the last one, attributes may not contain tags, is the other way around, right? The element contains an attribute. The attribute is contained inside the tag. And Simona, one thing about yes. the, the, the angle brackets, we have, we may find many angle brackets in philological editions and critical editions. So that's why we have to be, be careful. Um, yes, we can yeah. display them yeah. by using these entities over here. So if you type this in your content, that will be interpreted as an angle bracket inside your content. But if you type angle, an angle bracket like this, then the editor will expect an element. And that's why we need to escape them. Yeah, that's why and you more, have to, yeah, Gabby. Yeah, no, and, and um, more commonly, the angle bracket that appears in a, an edition of an ancient text will be, um, will be marked, right? It'll be lightened. So yes, we true. don't include the, the angle bracket um, because we're replacing it with an XML element. Um, in turn, which has the same meaning as the angle bracket had in the line. Yeah, unless the angle bracket means something like less than, but that's different. Uh, right. Okay, so now that we have looked at the five basic rules of XML, let's have a look at, at a, an error, a well-formedness error. So that would mean that our XML is not well formed, which means it will not be validated. And it also means that we can't do anything with it, like transforming it into HTML. So before we do anything else, once we've encoded something, we need to check the well formedness of our file. So here we have a book that has several pages, two of them currently visible on the screen. And these pages have some paragraphs of text in them. And as it frequently happens in books, one paragraph starts at the end of page one, and then it continues at the beginning of page two. Now here we see that um, the element page opens here, then we have one paragraph, then we have an opening paragraph, and then a page closes. But the problem is that we haven't closed this paragraph before we close the page. The closing tag of this paragraph is over here on the next page, and that's an overlap, and that's not allowed in XML. However, that's a really common real life situation, right? So what do we do, how do we tweak it to make it valid XML. We have several options. One of the good things of XML is that it's quite flexible um, and allows us to work around, around um, things. So one option is, for example, to close this paragraph inside the page where it belongs, where it starts, and then open another element paragraph on the second page where this paragraph ends. That's sort of correct, but it doesn't give us the meaning that the paragraph actually doesn't break, it's, it continues, it just continues over the next page. So what we could do is then use an attribute, for example, part, to say that this paragraph starts on this page, but this other paragraph is actually the same one, but it ends on the next page. So that's an example of how we could use um, an attribute. Another thing we could do uh, is use the empty elements that I mentioned, the ones that close with the forward slash at the end. They usually mean 
a boundary of some sort rather than they don't represent any content because they're empty right so we could use them for our pages to mark up our pages uh, which then would mean that we have the page begin over here as a boundary marker between the content of the previous page and the content of the next page and then we can have our paragraphs um, lined up like this without interrupting them because and without overlapping anything because the next page begin is also an empty element so empty elements don't mess up with the hierarchy because they don't have any content so in this case we have no overlap and this is valid so to sum up as we said um, XML must be well formed to be valid but also XML may validate to a schema which means that when you design your project you wouldn't normally use all of the hundreds of elements available in the TEI or in Epidoc or in any other um, convention like that you would ideally select the elements and attributes and values that you need for your own project which allows you better control and consistency and you do that by defining your schema your schema then once it's loaded in your XML editor um, gives you the menu of available elements and attributes that can appear inside elements attributes that must appear inside elements and so on and so forth so it basically gives you the rules according to which you would um, encode your texts and the schema enables your editor to validate your file to give you contextual menus and attributes and values and to offer you those um, helpful menus that we're going to look at when we actually start editing so there's two things well-formedness which means is this an xml file or is it something mangled that's not really xml um, and is this a valid xml file which also conforms to a certain schema and its rules and now i'm giving the microphone as it were back to gabby yeah thanks simona um so we um we, we don't have time now to, to do both of the examples that we had um, we had said we were going to do um, with this so I'm going to um, speed up a little bit um, and present the first of the two examples in the oxygen XML editor um, with a very quick introduction and this is something you'll have to you'll have to figure out for yourselves um, in, in, um, in, the, in the meantime um, we um, you can probably, if you want to have a go at the Papalogical Editor, um, do so. Um, you you may be able to get your instructor to help you um, help you with that um, in um, in the meantime. But um, but I'm afraid we'll 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 run out of time before we get to that today. It's entirely my fault for getting um, carried away in describing the Lightning conventions earlier. Um, so. For the um, for the first um, variant of the exercise that we um, we suggested for this session, um, we asked you to download the XML, uh, the Oxygen XML editor, um, register for a 30 day demo license, um, download the Epidoc template, which is the file that I've got open here um, on my screen, and um, that you can see. I may try to um, to zoom into that a little bit so you can see. Um, that's slightly more clearly if you're watching this on YouTube, um, and also to make a copy of the Epidoc schema into a new folder on your computer. Um, at the moment, we're pointing here at the top to the online version of the um, of the Epidoc schema, um, which means you don't need your own copy. But if for whatever reason um, you're trying to work offline, or or the network's not working great, or the server this is on is not working great, you can change this reference from being the online version to being a local version. And if it's in the same folder as your XML file, if you put both of these two files into the same folder. Um, then you just need to say the name of the file here at the top in, um, in your XML. And in either case, and you, you need to do it twice for the two references, um, and it will validate um, either to the online version or your local version, whichever one you do. Most, most of the time, that won't make any difference to you. Um, 
The, so you can see this is done um, color coding. This is um, this XML is plain text, as we said, but it's it's color coded and it's um, it's indented. Um, sorry, um, indented on the left um, here to to give um, better um, understanding of the structure. All of this is um, is not meaning carrying. It's just um, it's just meant to make make our lives easier reading it. Um, one nice thing that oxygen allows you to do is you see these little triangles in the left. You can hide an entire element, and so there's an element called TI header which contains lots of really important information, but which we're not going to talk about today. So I'm going to hide that entire element just by clicking on that little triangle. It isn't gone. You can see that the little triangle is still there, and you can always bring it back anytime you like. But I'm just going to hide it for today because that's not something we want to look at. Um, and then I'm going to go straight to um, to the, uh, the the edition here, the Greek and Latin um, text, um, and um, this so this template that you've um, you've downloaded. Um, it has text in various places where it belongs, but it doesn't have the actual text that you would put in an edition of a text. Um, rather, it gives an, it has an explanation of what sort of text you would want to put in there. So this text here that says Greek or Latin, etc. text here, we want to delete that because we don't need that anymore. Um, and I'm going to put, um, I'm going to paste in some text that I've got. I've taken this from the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania. Um, it's uh, text 991 from the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania. Um, and there's five lines of text there. You can even see a little five um, in the margin there, which we'll get rid of shortly because that's not part of the um, transcription, and this is text that um, that has been uh, encoded in the Leiden Conventions. As you can see, there's all sorts of brackets in there, and we're going to replace those brackets with um, XML tags. We're going to replace all the conventions in here, which mean um, things in the um, in the Leiden, and we're going to replace all of those with XML tags. And this, um, I, I'm only going to do the first couple of lines for um, for this um, for this uh, example, but. Um, this, this will sort of show um, the, the idea that when, um, when you encode something in XML, you don't also need to be encoding it in Leiden, because both of them are markup languages. You, can, you, you only need to use one at any given time. Um, and in transformation, you can then render it using, using Leiden, um, uh, Leiden conventions to, to display this as, um, as a web page or as, um, as a PDF or whatever at a later stage. Um, so uh, a couple of things about the XML editor before we start. Um, the XML editor, as I said, will do, um, uh, as Simone has just explained, will do validation for, um, for you based on your um, file. So this, this is just a template, and I've just pasted in some text um, in a text division, so there shouldn't be any, any problems in here. So if I hit this validation, validate button up here on the menu, I get a, a message down at the bottom here saying document is valid. Um, that's probably too small to see on the on the YouTube, but um, that's what it says. Trust me, and it's got a little green square that tells us it's valid. However, if I do something here to break this document um, and make it um, invalid or ill-formed, and then it will immediately tell me so. So, for example, um, there's this um, this AB element, which just means an enormous block. This is a block of text. Um, it's basically similar to a paragraph. If I add a tag to make this into an empty element by adding a little um, slash at the end of it, as Simona showed you a minute ago, um, we now have an empty element, and then we have a closing element afterwards. The closing element doesn't have anything to open because this is already closed because it's empty. So all of this text in between is ill-formed now. It's like, what the hell is going on? The whole thing's um, broken. And I didn't even have to hit that, the validate button for it to tell me this. I and mean, in fact, if I hover over it, it'll give me a message saying text is not allowed here. There's all sorts of other things um, broken. Um, so this is this is live um, um, validation. It validates as you go along. If I delete that slash again, then this will all go away because it's now well formed again. So this is this is live validation. That's very it's very useful. So um, there's also a link um, in the explanation of the exercises to a um, uh, a cheat sheet which will give you um, uh, slightly more information about the EPIDOC guidelines. Um, so I'm going to um, just very quickly make a couple of changes to this file and show you again a couple of the other features of the, um, the XML editor. I'm putting in blank lines there because as you can imagine when we've replaced these individual characters in here, many many of them in one line, with a whole bunch of 
um, XML tags, this line will be much, much longer. So I'm putting spaces in between them so it's easier to see what's going on. Remember that two carriage returns means exactly the same as one carriage return in XML. There's no, um, there's no concern about the spaces. Um, each, the simplest thing to start with is to say that each line of the text begins with this line beginning tag. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to you know, do this the easy way and just paste that in. Um, so this number five, which was in the mar margin of the text originally, um, this represents the line number. We've got another way of representing our line number, and that's using the, this n. Delete the five from the margin. Now the numbers are all lined in the XML. We can we only need to print as many as we want. So it'll print one in every five, just the same as it did in the in the original edition. Um, and so there are two um, there are two basic ways to put in um, a tag. In um, into into an, into your XML um, in uh, in Oxygen. The first is let's start with this um, this text here at the end of line um, four. Um, this string um, square bracket dot dot question mark dot dot square bracket. This means there is a gap um, of an unknown number of characters. Um, this is the, the version of Leiden that this particular text is. Doing. So we know the element for that. You remember that from a few slides ago. Um, the element there is an element called gap. So if I start typing, we, an element begins with an angle bracket. As soon as I type that angle bracket, Oxygen knows I'm typing an element, and it gives me a list of all the elements that are available in um, this schema. There are lots of them, many, many, many of them. That's, you know, if every time I had to enter an element, I had to go down this list and pick the element I wanted, that would be a pain. So instead, I can just type the first letter of G, first letter of gap, um, second letter of gap, that's the only one left. I then press enter. It fills in the rest for me. It knows that the reason attribute has to be there, um, and take my word for it, the, um, the the value of reason here is lost. Um, and I also need to tell it that it is lost um, a um, unknown extent is lost, um, but that it is an extent of characters that are that are lost. So as opposed to an extent of lines, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gap of less than one line rather than a gap of multiple lines. So you see here we have the, the empty element exactly as, um, as you, you used to seeing it. Um, you'll see this on the cheat sheet if you've, um, if you've um, managed, when you, when you download and look at that. Um, we have gap reason lost extent on a unit character. Here is the opening tag, and, and here is the closing tag with nothing in between representing that it is an empty element, um, as, as Simona showed you. Um, Oxygen also does another nice thing is if you have an opening tag immediately followed by a closing tag and you type the the uh, the forward slash right here at the end of the opening tag, it knows you don't need the closing tag anymore, so it gets rid of it for you. So just by typing, you can actually enter all this information much more quickly than you would do if you had to type. You can also type it all. Um, you could have kept typing, ignoring all those pop-ups um, until you got to the end. And when you type the closing angle bracket, um, all the pop-ups would disappear. But um, but the pop-ups are there to help us, right? The other way we can um, we can enter elements using um, oxygen um, is slightly more convenient even than that. Um, we have here a span of text starting at the very beginning of this inscription. Now we have an angle bracket, then we have imperatore caesar, and then the closing angle bracket e. So we have the e on the stone, but we know there was something lost before. It said imp caesar. Um, and so we, we put all that in square brackets. Um, uh, that again, me, I want to, to, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Once you've yeah. tagged something, get rid of the Leiden gap. Yes, good point. Have both that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sorry. Right. Cool. No, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would have made that point um, for, for, for what I'm about to say, but yes, it's worth making here as well. The gap here that is represented by the Leiden is now not needed anymore, so we can delete that. It's the, um, the gap. Um, as represented by Epidoc, um, already serves that function. And as you can see, even just adding that gap already is now too long for this screen. So I can put in um, a line break in there. This doesn't mean a line break on the stone because only an LB tag means a line break on the stone. A line break in the, um, in the text means nothing more than a space would do because, um, as Simona pointed out, um, the amount of space you have in any given place is not meaningful in, um, in XML, and that includes line breaks and tabs and various other things. Um, so the last example I'll, I'll give is, is these um, square brackets that I was talking about up here. Um, I don't want these square brackets here anymore because that's using the Leiden markup language, which, um, which we're not using anymore. We're getting rid of that, and we're instead going to use the Epidoc markup language to represent the fact that those letters are lost from the surface and restored by the editor. 
Um, so the, rather than typing in an opening angle bracket at the beginning of that line, and then oxygen will very helpfully give me a closing, um, closing um, tag um, after it as well, um, which I would then have to copy and move to the end of the, to the um, span. Um, if I highlight the span of text that, um, that I want to add an element to, and then I press Control and E, or Command and E if I was using a Mac, um, it will give me this tag menu, um, and I can select the tag I want from this list. Again, I can select it from the list, or I can start by just typing the, the first letter of it. And I want the supplied element. I this type of first three letters sub, and it's it's already found supplied on there. Apologies, you won't be able to see that on YouTube again. Um, I press enter, and it gives me supplied wrapped around that span of text that's in there. Supplied is currently underlined in red. Um, as I explained earlier, supplied is not unambiguous enough in TEI for Leiden because Leiden has two or three different kinds of um, of restoration that um, that need to be made completely um, unambiguous to me to, to be um, disambiguated. Um, and so we use the reason attribute for that. There is no reason attribute on this element yet, and so it is marked as invalid. The schema knows that we want to say reason. And this, this is what is, is telling us when we hover over that. It says validation. The element supplied is missing the required attribute reason. So um, if I just go to immediately after the name of the element inside the, the, the opening tag, uh, and we know that an attribute is separated from its element by a space, from its element name by a space, always. If I type a space after this element name, it immediately knows that I'm putting in an attribute. And I can select the attribute reason. I just start by pressing R. Um, I press Enter. And it knows that there's only five possible values of reason, reason. And in fact, the one I want is the first of those lost. So I simply press Return on there. So entering this, um, this element, um, entering that attribute actually took me about three or four keystrokes rather than the 12 or so it would have taken me to type it. Um, you can, of course, type it, as I said before. Um, so. I'm going to go through the rest of this document and I'm going to mark up everything in here, replacing the, um, the Leiden tags with uh, Epidoc tags instead. I'm, I'm not going to do it now live here on the video because we're out, we're out of time, but you, you, get, you get the principle, I think. Um, so the important thing is for you to try this out, um, experiment with the XML editor, the Oxygen editor, um, and see, see, how, see how this works. Also to download the Epidoc cheat sheet that we've given you a link to on the, on the session page and get, um, uh, so you can see which, um, which uh, Leiden conventions you want to replace with which tags. Um, apologies for, for rushing through that last bit um, so much. Um, I don't know why this particular session, we always massively overestimate how much, um, how much we're gonna be able to say in an hour, but um, I'll stop. I'll stop there. I think you're still. Gabby, here. Gabby, yes, yes, sorry, Gabby, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, I know. So we always think that uh, uh, 75 minutes is a lot. In the end, we need more time. But, and, and then I have to say that you talk about important things so it's very dense because and, and thank you for talking about and explaining the Leiden conventions because they are fundamental in digital philology and in this case they are specific for epigraphy and papyrology but still for every critical edition we have conventions and the interesting thing is that it's always of course we have these conventions there is an agreement on these conventions but there are they are always uh, uh, an interpretative act as for XML, because in the end, when, when you have to choose a tag, uh, you always have to read the text, and in many cases, we can have different editors who can choose different possible um, tags. There are there are these possibilities, so there are absolutely uh, yeah. yeah. So and, and we can represent this disagreement, or at least these different. Uh, Possible interpretations of the text, and yes. of course, different possible yes. Yes. encodings. Yes, and a couple, and a couple of points when I was talking there, I, I used the word objective in saying what what a what a what a tag or a, a Leiden a Leiden siglum meant. Um, that was, of course, an incorrect word to use. Nothing is entirely objective, as you say; it's always interpretive. Um, um, so, yeah, that was, um, that, that was well. Fun. It's a balance between them. Of course, we have these conventions yeah. to try to be objective as objective as far as we can, but still we always have, also because uh, our evidence, we mean, they are fragmentary, every, every, every evidence.
So this is the interesting yeah. part, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. well, we still have uh, yes, we still have six minutes, <laughs> and I don't know if there are questions. We have guests in the hangout, also new people. We have Elina and then Arada. Thank you for joining us today. Stelios. We also have people on YouTube. We have seven people now. I put a few links in the live chat on YouTube. And uh, so please, so Polina, any questions? It was, well, dance, of course, May. I, I wonder if maybe next year we shouldn't think about splitting this over two sessions. Of course, yes. I was going to say that. We've done this yeah. last year, we massively underestimated how long it would take us to talk about this. This is yeah. we yeah. trimmed it down massively this year and we still went and we, we still could have talked for two hours easily. Yeah. Hmm. We could just only the demos could take the whole time if you ask me. So if you're not yeah. careful, yeah. 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 Also because at the beginning so. you also talk about another important topic about open source softwares and then so here is a big discussion in the digital humanities, mm -hmm. also what we mean by open not necessarily free and uh, so we still have uh, uh, this problem and this is a maybe we can have also a session about uh, uh, <clears throat> using open tools what we mean by that because uh, sometimes there is a great misunderstanding and uh, but anyway no it was great we also have the description in uh, github i so we have um, a long <laughs> um, class outline so with links we have readings I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the page in github so you put readings further readings so we have many readings about the topic guidelines yes of course the epidoc guidelines and actually in the epidoc guidelines you can find uh, uh, well not only the, the Leiden conventions but other important uh, uh, descriptions and explanations in general about uh, how to encode uh, um, epigraphic and papyrological text so um, they are very useful in this sense and uh, so no questions please <laughs> we have guests looks like everything is clear I think no, yes, yes, I think so because yes, we, we had many things, but then thanks to to the slides, uh, we have links. So I think now we, we want students uh, or other people uh, try to use these tools. So in the yes, we have practical exercises in our uh, GitHub um, class outline. Um, yes, I'm reading them. So uh, we need. <laughs> Uh, the community to to work on that. Well, now it's yeah, Gabby, please. Uh, no, I was I was just oh, going, okay, okay. Just going to agree with, <laughs> and then uh, maybe say a bit more about the exercise, but but I don't desperately need to. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Now I'm looking at our uh, syllabus. Give me one second, because okay, next okay next. Uh, um, well, next week we start uh, um, well three sessions about tree banking, but we will still see some XML because, of course, we use XML also for morphosyntactic annotations. So this uh, class outline, this um, common session was important because this is an introduction to XML. So this is important also for other um, the text for other uh, topics, not only for encoding <laughs> inscriptions and papyri or. Um, critical edition. So next week we have uh, a common session with uh, Polina Jordanova. She's uh, today uh, in our Google Hangout and Maria uh, Vieros from Helsinki. She joined us before uh, and then she had to leave. But next week, okay, next week we start with annotating uh, three banks. Uh, as usual, I will post uh, the links and you can always find everything uh, online, the YouTube link, uh, we have uh, the slides. So thank you again, uh, Gabby and Simona. Uh, and so I wish you good night. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> okay. much. Okay. And see you next week. Okay. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Cheers. Bye.